Good afternoon. I'm Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and I would like to welcome you to our hearing on the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget, the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report, and the fiscal 2018-2022 preliminary capital commitment plan for the City University of New York. We will be joined by Matthew Sapienza, CUNY's Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, and Judy Bergstrom, Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning and Management. Thank you for joining us today. CUNY's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget of $1.17 billion does not vary tremendously from its fiscal 2018 adopted budget. As always, there are items in the state's 2018-2019 executive budget that remain in question, such as the state share of support for early child care services, ASAP programming, and operations at the Murphy Institute, soon to be a school. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget also does not include council initiative support, such as funding for merit-based scholarships, or the university's development of new remediation programs. We will, of course, want to discuss all of these things today. But this year, the Council is taking a new approach to its preliminary budget hearing to more effectively ensure that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to all New Yorkers. While efficiency and performance have always been priorities of this body, today we plan to scrutinize the organization of the city's budget more closely than in past years. For CUNY, this means that we will have a conversation about the limited number of units of appropriation used to describe vast areas of the university spending, particularly around the community colleges. We will also be taking a closer look at how CUNY organizes its $590 million fiscal 2018-2022 capital commitment plan. Many city agencies, CUNY among them, develop plans that front load the vast majority of their funding into a single fiscal year, then commit only a fraction of that amount. Today I would like to talk about why commitment rates are so low at CUNY and about how we can work together to come up with a more rational capital spending plan. I also look forward to learning more about how the university prioritizes its capital projects. This hearing presents us with an opportunity to review other programs and activities at CUNY as well. The state's proposal to require all SUNY and CUNY campuses to house food pantries raises important questions about costs and funding sources, but it also raises broader questions about CUNY students who are struggling to meet other basic needs. Turning to academics, CUNY has developed a number of programs and services to better meet the needs of the 21st century leaders over the past few years, and I would like for us to discuss these as well. We know that by 2020, post-secondary education will be required by 65% of jobs. That is why I am calling for a restructuring of the state educational policy to provide an option to all students to continue in a free state-sponsored education program for at least two years beyond secondary school level. Historically, by the end of the 19th century, it was apparent that compulsory education through elementary school was no longer adequate for the growing industrial age. Here now, we similarly see that the information age and advanced technology require higher levels of education. If we make provisions for post-secondary education, we will expand opportunity and increase access for those who have been marginalized and locked out. As always, I look forward to discussing hiring practices and the need for increased diversity both on CUNY's campuses and within its central administration, particularly in light of the fact that Chancellor Milliken will be departing. With Connected CUNY as a strategic framework for CUNY, I am particularly interested in recent trends since in 2015, data showed that over the previous 20 years, there had only been a 1% increase in black faculty, and there was a low percentage of blacks and Latinos in the PhD tenure track. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank 
my staff, particularly Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, Omawale Clay, my CUNY liaison, M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation, Paul Senegal, my counsel to the committee, Jessica Ackerman, senior finance analyst to the committee, and Chloe, Chloe Rivera, policy analyst to the committee. As members of the committee come, I will acknowledge them. At this time, I'm going to ask the council if he would administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today before the Higher Education Committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Barron. I am Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. I'm joined by Judy Bertram, Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning, Construction, and Management. We're also joined by several of our colleagues from the university who will assist us in responding to questions and concerns that you may have after the testimony. We very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about the Mayor's Fiscal Year 2019 preliminary budget and its effect on the City University of New York. Chairperson Brown, we very much appreciate your strong and continuing advocacy for our students. This higher ed committee and the entire city council, and especially you, Chair Barron, have always understood and supported a strong and competitive university. There has never been a time when education beyond high school was more critical for individual success and the city's economic competitiveness. Nothing is more important to the economic strength of our state and city and the vitality of our society than a talented workforce to attract good jobs and to foster the innovation necessary to remain competitive. The knowledge economy of the 21st century offers an array of exceptional career opportunities, but the most promising jobs increasingly require a college degree, and that trend is only accelerating. The high growth industries that are shaping our future need not just employees with technological skills, they need a workforce that is intellectually nimble, able to collaborate effectively, and able to function well in different cultures and languages. In short, they need talent, skills, and diversity. Those are the hallmarks of the college degrees that we offer at CUNY, and there is increasing evidence that businesses appreciate and are seeking employees with those characteristics. It's a win-win because the city and state prosper and our students realize their ambitions. As many of you know, a landmark study by a group of respected economists released last year demonstrated that CUNY is an unsurpassed engine of social mobility, lifting almost six times as many lower-income students to the middle class and beyond as all of the Ivy Plus colleges combined. CUNY colleges held six of the top 10 slots in the rankings of the institutions that did the most to advance the economic position of their graduates. Importantly, most of the students who benefit from a CUNY education are from unrepresented and immigrant groups, bringing much energy and creativity to our city and state. A shining example of this is Tamara Jean, the daughter of Haitian immigrants and a Hunter student in the Macaulay Honors College who was named a Rhodes Scholar, CUNY's eighth. As the Daily News said of Miss Jean's honor, and I quote, more quintessentially American, more quintessentially New York, it does not get, end quote. Essential to our student success at CUNY is recruiting and retaining an outstanding faculty. A critical goal in CUNY's strategic plan is to continue to increase the diversity of our faculty. I'm pleased to report that almost 44% of the new faculty hires last year were from un underrepresented groups, a continuation of a significant upward trend. The result is that the percentage of minority faculty members has reached an historic high of 36%. In addition, we have strengthened our faculty over the last few years by significantly improving terms for adjunct employees through negotiations with the Professional Staff Congress. Key gains include health insurance for eligible adjuncts and greater job security through three-year appointments for long-serving adjuncts. Now let me speak to the city's preliminary budget. We are pleased that the city's financial plan provides stability for our community colleges. Funding from prior plans will enable us to continue the expansion of the ASAP program, as well as programs targeted at college readiness, such as Algebra for All, CUNY Math Start, and 12th grade proficiency. We are extremely grateful to the City Council, particularly the Higher Education Committee, for securing resources in this year's budget for the City Council Merit Scholarships. We will ask for your advocacy again as funding for this critical student support program was not included in the FY19 preliminary budget. 
This initiative provides financial aid to students who graduate with an 80 average from New York City high schools and who maintained a B average at the university. These merit-based awards are available to deserving students at both senior colleges and community colleges and are a significant contribution to our efforts to speed time to degree. They demonstrate to our students in a tangible way that their city makes it possible to pursue an excellent post-secondary education right here at home. We look forward to working with you and ensuring that these financial aid awards are protected. We also need your help in restoring $2 million that was provided for remediation in the current fiscal year. CUNY has developed a plan to better tailor, rem better tailor remedial instruction to the needs of its students and to accelerate their degree progress. Advisors will strongly encourage students who have the greatest need, those who place into arithmetic and those who need remedial instructions in all three skill areas, reading, writing, and mathematics, to enroll in CUNY START or Math START, CUNY's effective programs that are helping students achieve proficiency. Other students will be counseled to enroll in a targeted workshop offered by the University Skills Immersion Program. All of these interv interventions are low or no cost for the student. Remedial students who cannot take advantage of these programs will have the opportunity to enroll in a co-requisite course, combining credit coursework with supplementary instruction. Our plan is to eliminate traditional course-based remedial instruction altogether within five years. Additional needs to support CUNY's ongoing efforts to complete completion rates, to increase completion rates, I'm sorry, are highlighted in our FY 2019 budget request. We are seeking city investment in several significant endeavors. The first is related to support for associate degree programs at our comprehensive colleges. The amount provided for these programs has remained constant at 32.3 million since 1995. Simply applying the higher education price index over that time period would have meant an additional 29 million in annual recurring support. Investment priorities also include new full-time faculty and discounted Metro cards for our students. Let me turn now to the state budget. CUNY's request to the state includes a three-year community college base aid funding increase of $250 per student full-time equivalent each year. This increase would generate an additional $11 million in fiscal year 2019. This request is a multi-year effort to increase state funding to a level that will enable it to adequately support community college operations and provide funding for strategic investments that will improve student outcomes. In addition, we are hopeful that the Senate and Assembly will restore funding for ASAP and child care centers. I would also like to take a moment to talk about the federal budget and particularly our deep concern with the legislation to reauthorize the Higher Education Act, which was approved by the House Committee on Education and Workforce in December 2017. This legislation, known as Promoting Real Opportunity, Success, and Prosperity Through Education Reform, or PROSPER Act, would make attaining a degree more expensive for tens of thousands of students at CUNY. The proposed total elimination of the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant Program, the SEOG program, would make college less affordable for those with significant need. In this academic year, over 26,000 students at CUNY will benefit from over $7.5 million in SEOG awards. The Federal Work Study Program, which helps needy students afford the cost of a, of a higher education degree, as well as provide valuable work experience, would also be significantly impacted. The initial analyses of the PROSPER Act show that once these provisions are fully phased in, CUNY would lose the most combined Federal Work Study and SEOG funding of any university system in the entire country. While the reauthorization of the Federal Higher Education Act is long overdue, we need to remain vigilant and ensure that the neediest New Yorkers have access to an affordable, high-quality, higher education system. Chairperson Barrett, please be assured that the university deeply appreciates your and the committee's continued commitment to a high-quality CUNY education, which is the vehicle that so many New Yorkers rely on for the path of upward mobility. I would now like to ask Judy Bergstrom, our Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning and Construction and Management, to talk about CUNY's capital budget. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairperson Barron and committee members. The City Council has been an outstanding partner to CUNY and especially to our community college by providing support for critical maintenance work and major new buildings. In recent years, your support has been instrumental in helping CUNY to complete North Hall's new quad at Bronx Community College. 
a major expansion of libraries at Maker Evers and LaGuardia Community College, a creation of a new dining facility at Queensborough Community College, the creation of the Fierstein's Graduate School of Cinema at Brooklyn College, and a renovation of the 500 Grand Concourse Building fourth floor at Hostos Community College. All these projects added or upgrade space and have enriched those campuses with modern, well-designed facilities that inspire students. Also, with your support, we've been able to start design on the new Allied Health and Science Building for Hostos. The major facility will provide classrooms and science labs for the college's Allied Health program, which provides essential workforce development. In addition, it will house a dental clinic that will provide students with practical experience and furnish the community with expanded service. In recent years, the council has provided over $300 million to CUNY and funded hundreds of projects, in particular at the community college where the need is the greatest. Because of your generous support of critical maintenance funding, CUNY has been able to address some of the most challenging critical maintenance issues at these campuses. In particular, your allocation of lump sum funds that allow CUNY to add projects that are in process has helped CUNY move several important critical maintenance projects along. Last year, the council provided CUNY $10 million, which CUNY has requested the state match that would then make it 20. And as you know from our previous discussion, achieving a state of good repair within the system is CUNY's priority. One of the largest ongoing critical maintenance projects is the replacement of the facade of LaGuardia Community College Center 3 building. This enormous building is 100 years old and its facade must be replaced if the building is to be preserved. I am happy to report that we expect to complete the construction of this $125 million project by the end of this year. I hope you will all take pride in the realization of what, what will be a community treasure. Other critical maintenance projects that have benefited from council funding are the ongoing campus-wide utility upgrade at Bronx Community College, a complete replacement of the electrical system at Queensborough Community College so that the college no longer suffers from power outages, and the phase renovation of Hostos Community College 500 Grand Concourse building, and roof replacements across the university which are in need of repair at every campus. We are pleased to report all this activity, but must emphasize that critical maintenance continues to be a major capital priority at our community college campuses, and we are still in need of your support for the long-term effort. We have over 7 million square feet of community college facilities, three quarters of which is over 40 years old. The most serious need remains to be the infrastructure system that supports facilities operations. Continued deterioration of these systems could lead to costly emergency repairs and, in some cases, major system failures. $750 million is needed to keep the backlog of deferred maintenance from growing, so you will continue to see requests for critical maintenance funding from our colleges. This year, approximately $120 million is identified, and identified projects need funding to cover critical maintenance items, such as fire alarms, roofs, boilers, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, facade, and windows. We are pleased to inform you that we're planning to expand our space and in with for the CUNY in the Heights program associated with Ostos Community College and the Borough of Manhattan Community College. The expansion will allow us to continue to increase vital higher education services to the community, providing many career ladders to educational attainment and careers. We estimate the expansion will cost five to six million dollars. We continue to seek additional city and state funding for the Hostos Allied Health and Science Building that I mentioned, and we are very much in need for another important initiative, which is $15 million for a new permanent home for Gutman Community College. The work on our facilities continues is integral to realizing those important goals. CUNY is a community treasure. Thank you for all your support and for all you do for CUNY and New Yorkers. I want to thank the panel for their presentation. I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Holden, member of the committee. We're glad to have you. And we're now going to jump right into the questions. We've got lots and lots of questions, and we want to be considerate of the time. So regarding the capital plan organization for the capital commitment plan, 
As I mentioned in my opening remarks, many agencies of the city have a history of front-loading the capital commitment plan, and CUNY is among those. So in addition to creating gross disparities in the amount of funding that's allocated in any given year, and the amount that CUNY can realistically commit, the practice eliminates the ability of the council to gain an adequate sense of how long individual projects will actually take to complete and you did reference some in your remarks. But last year, for fiscal 2017, out of the $298 million listed in the Executive Capital Commitment Plan, CUNY only committed $33 million. So what factors have traditionally gotten in the way of CUNY being able to commit more to its plan, and what made fiscal 2017 a particularly difficult year? Okay, fine. Um, the, the capital plan is really a um, accounting system. We look at it as the um, place where we go to to record and to uh, understand how much money is given by the the mayor, the city council, and the borough presidents. Um, for, for first and foremost, the issue that we have is what we call the state match, and I think you're. I didn't hear you. What is it called? It's the state match. For every okay. dollar you give us in this June, we have to wait till the following April for the city to match that. Um, if you take that a little bit further, we get the money in April. We can access the, the money in June. So it's really, we're waiting nine months um, once you give us the funding. Now, CUNY, you know, everyone likes to be different, but CUNY is different. We are not um, a cookie cutter operation. What I mean by that, if you go look at the SCA, they build buildings. Most schools have the, basically the same, a cafeteria. But CUNY, we are actually building buildings from the inside out. And what do I mean by that? Most of our community college colleges were not built as community colleges. If you take a look at Hostos, the building that I talked about that we're renovating used to be owned by an insurance company. Um, LaGuardia, Community College, the other building that I talk about where, we're, where we just completed the facade was the, the Nabisco cookie factory. So all our facilities we have to renovate from the inside out. The other issue we have is, um, and I don't think there are many other um, entities that have that, we live in a two budget world. We have the budget of the city and we have the budget of the state, and we have to marry those two. And what I mean by marrying those two, we have to receive approval from the a CP from, um, from OMB, and then we have to uh, receive approval from the state. This process take time, takes time. The other issue is the city requires us to have all the funding for a project up front. So if the project costs $10 million and the city allocates two or three million dollars, we have to wait to accumulate those funds. Now, eventually we do accumulate those funds, and I'll give you an example. You know, we every time I come here, I talk about um, the Bronx utility projects. We have spent almost, or we will when we finish, $170 million for the infrastructure. We started in 2003. We're up to phase number five. We're up to phase number five. Um, and what we did was we accumulated funds in order to basically take care of the infrastructure at Bronx Community College. So that's another issue. You have to have all the funds up front. Um, so let's look at last year. Last year, we requested, you generously gave us, the, with the mayor and the borough president, $80 million. So we waited for a match for that $80 million. That is sitting in this number that you quoted, the 298. Now, let's talk about the $80 million. Now, if that $80 million went to one building, it would be committed within, let's say, four or five months. But that $80 million consists of 20, 20 to 25 projects. And some of the projects are a million, some of the projects are two million. And I must say that the amount of work that we need to do for a $2 million project and the amount of work we need to do for a $10 million project is basically the same. So we have all these issues that are 
playing into that number. Um, so if I could just inter interject for a moment. If you have $80 million and if you have a $10 million project or a $2 million project, why wouldn't that project have been done when you had the $10 million? Why wouldn't you have just used the money then for the project that was $10 million or $2 if million? We got, if we got two, if we got Say, two million, if we got two million on project, Cost ten million. We've got to wait to get the additional eight million. And meanwhile, it's okay, not but just you have eighty million dollars now. Yes. In that eighty million dollars, you could not have taken some of that money for that ten million dollar project that you had. Yes, we will. We will. So then, why did you have to wait? Because it seems that perhaps the timetable would have allowed once you got the ten million rather than to let it accumulate to 80? Well, because in order to, we have to get the match. In order to, right. we have to get the match. And we can't go, we have it allocated by campus, basically, so it's equal. So every campus gives in a request. Every campus gives in a request, and that's what we match. For, for, for fiscal 17, um, there was a registration of 34.8 um, million for phase five of what I just described, and that it was posted to 2018. Um, and also, we believe that our number for this year will be higher than the prior years. Um, the other issues is projects that are delayed, and projects are delayed for one reason is that we don't get enough funding, and the other reason is that when we start looking at a project, um, and I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at a track, the track at Bronx Community, we made a request, um, we started, we looked at design, and we thought it was just going to be repaving, but as we took a look, we had to worry about the drainage. So a project had to worry that, about drainage. Drainage. So a project that started out as 500 thousand dollars landed up being three million dollars so that we don't have the we don't have the funding for that the other thing is we plan we plan ahead um, and the issue for us is that if you're going to do construction in a building um, when school when when classes are 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 happening you need to have swing space or you need to have um, it arranged with the campus that they can still run classes. And sometimes that becomes a real, real big problem. So you have what I just described before, scope change. We're doing construction. We're doing construction while school is running. If we could close down our schools, we could do construction much faster. But we kind of don't have that, that luxury. Um, and the last, the last thing that I have to say is, can we do a better job? And, and push more projects out, yes. We are looking at that. Um, we're meeting about that, and we're talking to our colleges about that. So that, I'm try, I kind of gave you a flavor of what we are up against. So you may have answered this in your question, but if you could just clarify it for us. Uh, for city funds that have to be matched by the state, does that money have to be included in the city's capital budget or just in its capital commitment plan? It has to be included in a published plan, and that is usually the September plan. The capital commitment plan? Yeah. Okay. Um, so do city funds have to be included in the immediate fiscal year? Because you talked about a yes. gap. And you have to yes. Yes. Okay. So they can't be included in the out years? No. Okay. If they're included in the out years, we don't get the match. Okay, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez as well. Okay, so now for the part project prioritization, CUNY relies on 100 buildings to support students across its seven community colleges. And the average age of these buildings is more than 50 years, and you reference some that are much older than that. So while the buildings, uh, some of them are close to 100 years. So how do you prioritize your capital spending? 
Okay, <clears throat> the number one priority is life safety concerns. And the projects that I've mentioned, Bronx Community College, um, if you recall, I think it was in 2000, I think when I first came, it was 2007, um, there was a, a, a large sinkhole at Bronx Community College. Um, and that was the beginning of our spending funding on the infrastructure there. Um, so that it, the first thing is the life safety. And the other one that I mentioned, uh, Center 3, which I, I have to tell you, it's a building. It's 800,000 square feet. We have campuses that are in 800,000 square feet. And the reason that we're spending $125 million on just the facade is because that was a dangerous condition. So we start with where there are dangerous conditions. And Queensboro Community College, um, actually when I first got to CUNY, they, um, they, had more bla they had blackouts every single week. Now we have spent, how much we spent? 42 million in, on that, and that makes a really, really big difference. So our number one, our number one issue is emergencies. Um, and now that we've spent this money, the number of emergencies are um, decreasing. Now you ask how we prioritize. Um, we look at the critical maintenance, but we have done a critical maintenance study for the whole university, community colleges and senior colleges. And we are now in the process, of, this is the, we did one in 2007, we did one in 2012, and now we're doing another one. And that gives us the condition of every single every single facility, and we use that to prioritize what we're going to do. So the critical maintenance studies that you've done over the years, I think you said 2007, 2012, right. what do you see? Do you see carryover? Are the same projects that were, are the same conditions that were identified in the first study also still in the second study? Or how are you tracking that? How are you addressing those that are identified in each of these the, the answer to that is in some cases the the where we've spent money the problem has decreased where we have not spent mo money the the situation um becomes worse so but, have but, some have some capital projects gotten priority over what was in the critical maintenance study or does does cuny say listen all of these on our critical maintenance list have got to be done before we do other projects. Everything's prioritized. Um, does anyone have a book, the book? Yeah. Okay, so we put out this book. We put out this book, and I think you've gotten copies. It's, it is, it's, it's 200 pages long. Mm -hmm. It lists every single school, and it lists the priority. Um, it lists the priority for the senior colleges and the priorities for the community colleges. Um, we sit down with every college and we work this out. Because for instance, let's say that there's a school that has a problem with three roofs, all right? And let's say each one is at the same level. We can't shut down, let's, we can't shut down one, one building. Um, we can't shut down all three buildings to do the roofs. We have to make a decision and we do one roof this year, and we do another roof like two years from now. But this is what the priority is. So all of the lists that the, all, all of the items that are in the book as priorities, do they bump some of the items that were on your critical main? Do you have a master critical maintenance list? And how do projects that are in this fit into your master or your Comprehensive critical this maintenance. This is the master list. This is it. This is and so in here, we can identify which of these priorities are on the critical maintenance list? I would say if you look in here, 85% of them are critical maintenance. Or almost 90% are critical maintenance. Okay, so can we get the critical maintenance list from the studies that you've done over the past years? Can we get that list? Sure. Okay. I'm gonna, I have lots more questions, but I'm gonna defer to my colleagues who are here. I'm sure they have questions as well. Yeah, yeah as a, I was in CUNY for 40 years, New York City College of Technology as a professor, 
And I can attest to the fact that we had to make do in buildings that were not made, they weren't built for a college. We were in a con ed facility. We were in a factory. And our newest building was built in the early 60s. Right now, I left, obviously, to be in the city council. And of course, they're opening new buildings. It's, it's a wonderful renaissance in downtown Brooklyn. Um, but we always wondered why we couldn't get on the list. I was there 40, like I said, 40 years. And it didn't seem like New York City College of Technology was a priority. Uh, and especially, we're, we were the only college of technology in the university. And so I'm glad to see that there's been an investment and certainly technology. And you, as you know, with technology comes special needs, obviously, in the building itself, the infrastructure. Um, and the, the problem with um, adding on, we, we rent buildings, obviously, lease buildings, and we were just constantly moving. And being there 40 years, uh, we never had enough. Our buildings never operated properly. We never had enough power. Uh, so I'm glad to see the investment. I see the, I, I'm seeing it for, I mean, I witnessed firsthand the daunting task you, you have, and I appreciate it. And um, anything we can do in the city council to make it a little easier. Um, but I do see an improvement in CUNY. I've seen an improvement over my 40 years, and I want to thank you for your testimony. I know the capital projects, that's the toughest area. There's, there's so many things. We had leaks. We had, um, even when we had new construction, there were problems in, um, in, in um, getting the building operational. Um, air quality, obviously, we had a big problem with. Asbestos, we had a, a problem, and, and that's the critical issues we're seeing throughout the university. You, obviously, you have to put these in priorities, but we also felt, I mean, I felt that the college was really a stepchild for many years. I know it's changed. I, we can't talk now because they have a new building. And by the way, did that open yet in downtown Brooklyn at, 30, at 300J or across the street? It's, it'll open in the next month. Great. Okay. Just, uh, but it'll open mid-semester or? Um, it will open, but, but the faculty will move in okay. for classes. So I have probably. to go back there and see. It's a, it's a wonderful looking building. And um, they have many buildings. And the college does a great job, has a great president. Um, but I just, again, I want to thank you, and I understand the task, but anything we can do to make it a little easier on the capital end, we certainly would like to hear some more. Thank you. So, so let me, we're going to open that building. Um, it's 400,000 square feet. Um, it's, it's magnificent, and it's going to have all the technology classes in there. Um, so all of that is moving out, all of that is moving out from an old building to a new building. The new building is the building, two of the floors we're renovating now so that we can use that space. Um, and the Voorhees building, we renovated that. So I think if you went back to New York City Tech, the world that you saw it looks totally different because New York City Tech looks totally different. Yeah, my, college, my department was communication design, and I, I know they renovated the, what was called the Pearl Street building. That's and the, right. And they're working their way up, which is, a, is great. And the facade will eventually be done. That, that area, by the way, at, at Tillery and Jay, where the, Brook, where the uh, Brooklyn Bridge uh, comes in, is probably the, the busiest uh, corner. Uh, and, and it does deal with pollution problems. It was, it was, I think, noted as the most polluted corner in the city of New York uh, because of all the, uh, the congestion there. But I do appreciate the daunting task again, and I, and I want to thank you for your investment um, and your, your great work in the, in the colleges. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Councilmember Rodriguez, do you have questions? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, one more time, one more budget hearing, same place. You know, the city rely on CUNY to prepare a working class to turn, turn our working class into middle class and to provide opportunity for the middle class to continue using CUNY. Many of us are here just because of CUNY. However, CUNY being defunded for so many decades when it comes to the real need. And what we have seen is also a reduction of our black and Latino students in our, in our senior colleges over and over. Like, you only got to walk through City College. 
I was there, 80% of the students were black and Latino when I was there. I believe that today population in a city college has to be probably on the 70, right? Is that accurate? Uh, Councilman Riggs don't have that information on city, but oh, thank you. Wait a I do have that information. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, yes, for undergraduate, um, undergraduate enrollment at City College, 17.9% um, are white, 34.4% Hispanic, 18.9% black, 287 Asian and Pacific Islander, 0.2% uh, American Indian, Native Alaska. Yeah. And they used to be, again, when I was there, mm -hmm. Starting there in 87, the population was 80% black and Latino. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's not about just blaming CUNY, it's about the pipeline. It's about preparing the students to go to be college material. So I know that sometimes we expect and we ask CUNY, but this crisis is like the MTA. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, I believe and I lived that experience. They, when I used to be a teacher in a high school, Gregorio Luperon High School, mm -hmm. there was many students that they were 87 average, and they would apply, and they did not get a seat into a senior colleges. And then I know that later on, the Office of Admission of City College, they did a pipeline, they did a pilot project. And years after, two years after, they took few students who were in the same average that they were refusing seat before. All of them who got the opportunity to get into a senior college graduated with a three and above point average. So I think that we need to be more creative <coughs> on how we also take our students who right now, the only option is going through a community college and be able to <coughs> provide them the opportunity to get into a senior college, even though probably they, are not, they don't get the best SAT, but still, if they are given the opportunity to get into a senior college, they will graduate. And I know that this is something, the reason why, why CUNY and City College did that pilot project was because there was an interest to find out, to come out with a solution. And I just hope, again, I don't know what have happened after that pilot project, but I just hope that more students whose average are 85 get the opportunity to get into a senior colleges, especially if we are committed to maintain the diversity in our higher education. I have a concern, or a question concern, which is about when we look at the number from the 275,000, we look at 11 senior colleges. And then we look at seven community college. Mm -hmm. And in seven community college, we have how many, 98,000 students? Uh, correct, we have about 97,000 <laughs> students at the community college. Yeah, in seven campus. Mm -hmm. Are we, and again, the answer for me is about so that we as a city and the state and everyone together deal with the reality, with funding. Are we operating on capacity or are our seven campus right now working over capacity? Um, Councilman Rodriguez, um, on the community colleges, it's a mixed bag. And what I mean by that is that um, we have a campus like Kingsboro out in Brooklyn whose enrollment's been down the last few years who could take more students. Um, we have BMCC down the street here that has 27,000 students this year and whose enrollment keeps growing every year. Now to BMCC's credit and to President Perez's credit, they find a way every year to make sure that they have courses early in the morning, late at night, Saturdays, Sundays. I mean, you know, they, they have a 24-7 campus just about. Um, so to, to go back to your earlier point, because you, you raise a very good point, and, and we very much appreciate at, at the university um, folks like you and Councilmember Holden and, and Chair Barron who are 
um, products of CUNY and who know the, the power of, of what we do at the university. Um, our feeling is we, we know that one of the main missions of CUNY is access. And we want to find a home for any student that wants to come. Um, so again, I agree with you, it goes back to preparation and, and are they prepared to do college work and, and at what level, but, um, but anyone that wants to come, we want to find a home for them. And but I, do it but on seat, because this is about, if you, if you don't share with us the reality, we cannot con advocate at the city and state level, say, guy, you know, the number of classrooms that we have in yeah. the seven campus, if we have a projection for the next five years, and that, that population continue growing. Yeah. That seven campus will not sustain the number of students that will be applying. Can we say that today the seven campus are enough, or can we say that there's a need to be more space for a student? In this case, let's look at just community college. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think the, you know, we, we definitely need more space at our community colleges. Um, you know, we have seven community colleges. We opened up Gutman about five years ago, which was the first community college we opened up in 40 years in New York City. Um, but space is always a concern. So what we're doing, one of the things we're doing is trying to um, be more creative and be more innovative in how we offer the programming. So an example of that is, um, more online programming, which is a big part of the university's strategic framework. We want to have more online course offerings. Um, but one of the things I, I just want to say about our enrollment and, and how we're serving more kids and keeping to our mission of access is that this past academic year, we graduated 52,000 students at the university, thanks to the great work of our campuses, the great work of our faculty. That's the highest amount that we've ever graduated in the history of CUNY, going back to 1847, 52,000 students in one year. One of our concerns, though. So what is the breakdown? Is that graduation for both community yes. and senior colleges? Yes, total what, graduation. What, what is the breakdown of community college from that number, 52,000 community colleges and senior colleges? Michael's pretty amazing, by Great. the way, so thank you. <laughs> um, 37, about 37,000 at the senior colleges and about 15,000 at the community colleges. 15,000. 15,000. So um, the point I wanted to make is. And, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, no, no, we'll go ahead. Have the understanding. With yeah. the 15,000, what yeah. was the cohort? What was the expectation? Was that the number that we're supposed to be graduating? Or we can say because oh, more than 80% of the students, they need remedial courses going to community college and that reality that we right. know. Can we say that that number compared to the cohort that we're supposed to be graduating was supposed to be lower or higher? Well, graduation rates overall at the community colleges are on the upswing, and, and a big part of that is because of the ASAP program, which I know you're very familiar with. Um, so the, the graduation rates are increasing at the community colleges, there's no question about that. Um, so, and know. that number, that, that number who graduated from community college. Yes. And, and I don't know if you will have a number, the data to bring it right now. What percentage transfer to senior colleges? I don't think we have that information, but we'll get that to you. But okay. let me, on that point. Because, because yeah. as you will look at it later on, share the information with us, as you know, that's a concern that the chair, chairman and yeah. chairwomen and, and, and us we have, which is about how many of those who graduated from community college yes. are getting into senior college. No question, it's a great point. Um, it's something that, you know, again, goes back to the power of CUNY. We want students to articulate to the senior colleges. And one of the things that we did about two years ago, which um, we think was, uh, you know, is really important is we went something called reverse transfer. So students, m many of students, a a a as you know, Councilman Rodriguez, that do move from community college to senior colleges, do so before they get the community college degree. So before they get 60 credits, before they get their associate degree, they've done enough coursework where they're able to transfer into a senior colleges and they move. Um, but what happens is they're now leaving without a degree. So that's from the student's perspective. The college perspective is they're getting no credit for that student as part of their graduation statistics. And so what we've done is something called reverse transfer where when students do accumulate 60 credits in total, 
they get that associate degree, even though they've already moved to a senior college. And we think that's really important for a student because they need to have something for the good work that they've done to get to 60 credits. Um, and so we implemented that about two years ago. If I can, just for a minute, I just want to go back to the point about the highest number of graduates we ever had. So we had 52,000 graduates last year, which is tremendous, and that's why we're here, is to graduate students. But we were concerned on the back end that because we graduated so many more students than we normally have, that that was going to mean a decline in our enrollment this year, because we had to make up for so many students that, that left with a degree. However, our enrollment this year is actually up about 1%. Um, so our colleges are doing great work finding a home for the students that want to come. The students are, you know, we're, people are voting with their feet. They're still coming to CUNY. We're doing, you know, tremendous work. Um, but I agree with you. Access is, you know, absolutely one of our critical missions and something that we're 1,000% focused on. One, one problem that happened in my alma mater, City College, is to graduate a student from the engineer department is more expensive mm -hmm. than any other field. How is CUNY supporting City College to be sure? And I just say City College, it could be the same thing in Hunter College and any other senior college that there's field that is more expensive to graduate a student than others. Mm -hmm. How is, city, how is CUNY working with institution uh, city college to be sure that there's a support of funding to maintain and increase, especially we had a school of engineer, mm -hmm. that as far as I know, is the one that graduated the larger number of students of color. So are we have projections to continue funding that school so that there's enough funding to keep adding, increasing the number of students in that field? Right, no, it's, um, I'm glad you raised City College in general. So City College um, has definitely had some fiscal challenges the last couple of years. Um, we're very pleased that uh, a new president was appointed there, President Boudreaux, and he's- It's a good one, by the way. Thank you, yes, we agree. Um, he's been um, terrific and has tackled, uh, even when he was the interim president, has tackled this fiscal problem head on and has been extremely transparent with the campus community as to what's happening there and what the plans are. We're working very closely with them at the university level. Uh, President Pedro was in my office, I think last week or the week before, and we're actually meeting tomorrow as, as well. So um, we've been in constant contact with them trying to um, resolve the fiscal issues they have. The Grove School of Engineering, um, one of the best uh, schools that we have in CUNY, I would argue it's one of the best engineering schools that's out there, period. Um, but um, you raise a very good point that engineering is very expensive, a very expensive program, um, and um, it's something that, again, we have to okay. continue to manage in collaboration with the college leadership. Okay. My last uh, question is about something local, which is the CUNY's in the height. Yes. You know, our great Jay, John Kataski, he has been trying to help us on putting a meeting together. But one thing that I want to bring to CUNY, everything is local and community college are funded by the city. And we just hope that as it, you put in place any programming for the CUNYs in the height, that we have like discussion about what is the projection, what is the plan, because I do believe that CUNYs in the height provide the opportunity for us to look at some point to have a plan to in the future to be turned as another community college. Mm -hmm. Yes, we love the CUNY in the Heights program. We have uh, a request in our budget request, which is on, on the CUNY website, um, so for additional space for CUNY in the Heights. And I know uh, Vice Chancellor Bergstrom has been working very closely trying to secure additional space in the building that they're in now. We're in the process of negotiate, negotiating the lease for an additional 15,000 square feet, and we're almost there. Thank you. Um, I have some more, uh, just before I move on to back to the budget questions, the data that I have in response to Council Member Rodriguez's question, there is a disparity between the uh, demographics of students at the community colleges as, co as compared to the senior colleges. So the data that I have says that there's about 25% black students at senior colleges and 
at community colleges. And then for the Hispanic population, it's 26% at senior colleges and 40% at community colleges. So when we talk about uh, the professions that are higher end and that are more demanding, we see that the students who are black and Latino are not in the senior colleges in the same numbers as um, other ethnic groups. So we need to, I think, look at that. And in terms of the question, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. I want to get back to some more of the budget questions. So once a project is funded on a particular campus, how does the process work for that campus uh, to draw down the funding? On a, a capital project? Yes. Once, once the project, that we're talking about a community college or community college, right? Is, are the processes different? Let's do the community college. Okay. Um, the com if, we, if a project's funded and we have enough funding, right. um, we go to the city and we get what's called a CP, which is a certificate to proceed. Um, which what that basically tells us is that OMB is looked and we have enough money to move forward. Then, then I'm assuming if we've gotten the match already, then we have to go to the state and get what they call. So do you have to have the match before you go to OMB because I thought yeah, you You have okay. to have all okay. the money. But right. I'm, I'm just answering your question. I'm assuming yes. we have it all. So okay. we go to the city. Mm -hmm then we go to the state, and then we can move forward. Okay. And so then, what role does the president uh, play in this? You talked about you have to have swing space, so what kind of? Well, b before, you, you know, before this book is put together, we sit down and we talk with the president before they're gonna request something, and we say, if we're gonna take, you know, six or seven classrooms offline, what are you going to do? If this okay. is what you want your request to be, what do we, and we work, basically work it out. So we do this um, right with the presidents. Okay. Um, CUNY's fiscal 2018-2022 capital commitment plan includes 34 budget lines and 591 project identification codes. And this makes it nearly impossible for the council which adopts the city's capital commitment plan each year by budget code to hold CUNY or the city to any level of accountability for the progress of these individual projects. So 91% of CUNY's capital commitment plans falls into just one of 10 categories labeled miscellaneous reconstruction. So does CUNY use more specific categories to analyze its capital projects. So first, let me explain how this works. The three there are 10 categories. We can only use three. One is miscellaneous construction, another one is gymnasiums, and the third one is, is equipment. Those are the only three. That's technology. The other seven are not related to us. But let me explain the, um, the 500 number. We look at the budget as an accounting system, and what that number represents, remember we represent 24 colleges and the projects on each campus. So let's pick a project at Medgar Evers, and let's say that project has money from, this, from the mayor, the city council, and um, the borough presidents. So that's three numbers for that one project. So let's just say we don't have enough money and we sit, with those, we sit with that amount of money and we wait till the next year. So the next year, that project gets three more numbers. So if you take my example and you multiply it by the number of campuses, that's how you get the number 500. Now, as far as it's a tool, as far as using that as a tool, to basically see the status of our projects, I understand that's not, that's not really very helpful to you. But for us, as a budget mechanism and a budget, budget document, it's very helpful. So I know your issue is transparency. Yes. And seeing, so what we've done um, for our board, and we started this um, in June, 
if you go online and you look in the CUNY website, you will find a list by college, a list of all the projects that are in pre-design, design, and construction. And it will give you information on when we project that project to be completed. Now, this is a, um, this is a project in the works. Um, based on what you're telling me and the, the questions that you're asking, we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at what we've posted and we're gonna see if there's any more information that, that we can add. So we started this in June. Um, I'm just about to post this every, we're gonna do this every six months. After our board meeting, I will post the next six months. Do we have the 10 categories? And if you take a look at this and there's other information that you want added, we'd be happy to add it. So if you wanna see where projects are, that's the place to go. You will see it for every community college and you will see it for every senior college. So you will see where we are and what's happening with your funding. But now, the question that I asked, though, said that the capital commitment plans falls into just one of the 10 categories. So you named three. You said gymnasium, you said equipment, technology, and I forgot. Those are the three that, that we use. So but, but think about this. How many times do we do gymnasiums? That's why everything else. So what happens to the other seven? Why do you only use three? The other seven are not related to capital construction. Okay. It, I think it's, it's the way the system is created. But I understand if, if your issue is you want transparency and you want to see where we are. Can you send that, Doc? Can you send that information to us so that we don't? If, if you wait till the end of the month, I'll send you the most up-to-date one after the board, after the CUNY board. Can you send me what you already have so that, because sure. we're just about the beginning of this month, so if you send sure. me what currently exists. Okay, good. Uh, so new projects in the preliminary, oh, and I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Cumbo, member of the committee. Uh, new projects in the preliminary capital commitment plan. The fiscal 2018-22 preliminary capital commitment plan includes three new projects with $6.6 .6 million in new money added for fiscal 2018. So can you describe each of those projects, tell us what they will do, and the total projected budgets and the estimated timelines of completion? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the first one is the data center at 395 Hudson Street. The construction of the data center is almost complete, maybe in the next two weeks, and we will be using um, these funds to buy equipment. We will be buying equipment this year, and we will be buying equipment next year. So it's a data center of, to be utilized by? All of CUNY. All of CUNY. Right. Okay. The, the second project is really, I find, um, very exciting. Um, it's Baruch College. If you go to 25th Street between um, Lex and 3rd, you will see that the street is closed. Um, this is a project for the construction of the street, um, which we will basically turn into a campus for Baruch. The city has been unbelievably cooperative, DOT. DDC is going to do the construction. The construction will cost approximately $6 million. Um, and, you know, your, your first question, it's very interesting. We started this project <coughs> almost um, I don't know, five or six years ago, and the city council funded a part of it. But what did we have to wait for? We had to wait for DEP to take care of the construction, um, the underground construction. So this money, uh, this is gonna create a campus for Baruch College. So it's pretty amazing. Um, the last project is one of the things I talked about, it, an emergency. Um, it's a bridge at Bronx Community College. Um, it connects to the gym. The bridge was deteriorating, and it's going to cost us about $700,000 to, um, to renovate the bridge. And those are the three projects. Uh, we want to move on to the expense budget organization. CUNY has a total proposed budget of $1.2 billion for fiscal 2019, all of which is organized into three broad categories, 
or paired units of appropriation. But more than 95% of all of that money falls into these pairs, supporting community colleges. So CUNY uh, has conversation, has CUNY had a conversation with OMB about restructuring funding for the community colleges into more units of appropriation. As you have apparently have not had those discussions with OMB, but again, uh, going back to what Vice Chancellor Bergstrom said, anything that um, the council or um, OMB, mayor's office feels can bring more transparency, we're happy to have those conversations <coughs> um, with both OMB and with uh, the council finance division. Okay, so according to the distribution of funds by object code in OMB's records, $542 million out of the community college's $1.1 $1 billion budget falls under a single budget code, 2430, mm -hmm. labeled Community College Central Administration. So that's more than a third of the budget, and uh, obviously a third of the money cannot just support CUNY Central, and a significant portion of that money must be distributed across campuses over the course of the year. So in order to run the university system effectively, CUNY presumably must have its own internal system of tracking funding outside of the system that OMB currently uses. But this is in no way provides a level of transparency required for monitoring agencies, including how the council wants to track how funds are spent. So how does CUNY track its budget internally? in comparison with how OMB tracks CUNY's budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're right, Chair Ben. The, the overwhelming majority of those funds that are in that, that budget code that you mentioned, 2430, do end up through budget modifications th throughout the fiscal year being allocated to the community colleges. Um, and so it reverts back to that code at the beginning of the fiscal year, and then we allocate it to the community colleges. Um, again, going back to what Vice Chancellor Bergstrom on the, on the capital side, on the operating side, We've also, working with our board of trustees, have a new process in place where the board adopts a budget in June. Um, and as part of that process, we've been updating our budget um, quarterly throughout the year. Um, this is our latest, this is our actually our fiscal 19 preliminary allocation, which we just presented to our board fiscal committee last week. Um, again, as the capital, all this is on our website. This is a 189-page report, so it's very line-item detailed. Um, so again, we, we um, are definitely focused on transparency. Um, we want to report these uh, budget allocations publicly at our board meetings. These reports, again, are on our website and do provide a, a level of detail um, to the allocations in terms of what we're monitoring as the college budget. Okay, so can you explain to me how you track it internally as? Sure. Okay, so. Yeah, so we, um, at the beginning of every fiscal year, we, we allocate funds to our colleges based on how much is available from state, city, tuition. Um, we make a determination about the allocations to the colleges. We issue those um, allocations. Um, colleges then are um, required to submit financial plans that are developed in consultation with elected uh, student and faculty leaders and submit them to the Office of Budget and Finance for review and approval. Um, then throughout the year what we do is we are monitoring, when I say we, I mean the Off Central Office of Budget and Finance, we're working every single day with the campus fiscal personnel to review their expenditure patterns, um, how much revenue they're collecting in terms of tuition revenue, um, their staffing, their headcount, how many people they're hiring, um, so that we're monitoring how, how they're doing from a fiscal perspective. And then we do quarterly reports that, uh, again, now that we are um, publicly reporting those quarterly reports to our board fiscal committee um, on a quarterly basis, and um, those are, again, posted to our website. So they, they are public, um, and that's our way that we track how the colleges are doing from a fiscal perspective. But certainly, um, if we are concerned about any one college's um, fiscal condition, um, we'll call them in, have a meeting, um, ask them to resubmit a financial plan, um, work with the presidents and their fiscal staff mm -hmm. to make sure that they're on, they're on good footing. 
So a college gets an allocation based on what criteria? <coughs> we, we look at how Is it numbers? Does everybody get the same allocation per student? Is it programs? How do you determine the funding that an individual college will receive? So for the senior colleges, um, it's, it's incremental base budget funding, a similar way to the way the city um, allocates to their agencies. So each senior college has a base budget that rolls over from year to year, and then we make incremental changes to that. Hopefully we're adding to those incremental base budgets on, 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 every fiscal year. Sometimes, unfortunately, we have to reduce, but um, the senior college's incremental base budget. The community colleges, are di we do differently in that we have an allocation model um, that um, has a few different factors, but the, o the overwhelmingly dependent factor in the community college allocation model is enrollment. Um, so the more enrollment a college has, the, the more of the funding they'll get. So community colleges are a little bit more towards the zero-based funding um, in that every year we start over and we run the allocation model. Um, so two different ways of, of allocating between the seniors and the communities. Um, and we, at the beginning of every year, will present that to the community, to, to the colleges. Um, and again, we'll always give the colleges um, some advance warning based on, for instance, where we are now. We know what the, the governor's executive budget proposal was. We know what the mayor's preliminary budget proposal was. So we have a sense of what the budget picture is looking like for next year and communicating that to our colleges. Okay, could, could you send us copies of that as well so that we can Absolutely. have that? Absolutely, yes. How are funds assigned to the central administration spent or distributed over the course of the year? Similar process to how we do the senior colleges. Um, there's a base budget that we you know, roll from year to year. Um, on the central uh, administrative um, budgets and what we call our shared services centers, um, which, is, which is part of central, um, that provides services to the on behalf of the colleges. We've actually done some significant reductions over the last three years. We've reduced, um, we've done reductions to the central office and shared services budgets of 13% over the last three years. So we're trying to redirect um, more resources from administrative areas, um, both at central and at the colleges, to uh, instruction and student support areas. Um, but Again, the central office, in terms of the process, is done very similar to the senior colleges. Are there ever circumstances in which money assigned to central administration is routed to a CUNY foundation? No, not from central administration, not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, uh, fa foundation monies are uh, privately raised. They're, they're separate 501c3s, and so um, tax levy money does not get rerouted or allocated or transferred over to foundations. And what type of monitoring or recording do you do of foundation money that is given to CUNY? How, how is that recorded and where is that recorded? The foundations are required um, at the end of every fiscal year to um, provide audited financial statements to the university, um, which is part of the university's comprehensive annual financial statements that we issue every, um, by October 31st of every year. Um, so we monitor them in that way. Um, we also have a new policy where um, each college president has to report on their um, discretionary non-tax levy money of which foundation money could be, uh, is a subset of. Um, and so those are the ways that we, we monitor it. Okay, a few, a few more questions and I thank you for your patience and for your thoroughness in answering questions. Uh, for the new needs, the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget includes very few new needs for CUNY. Uh, regarding the New York Solar Smart, the preliminary budget adds a new ombudsman for New York Solar Smart, an initiative to lower the cost of installing solar panels across the state, and the ombudsman will be based out of CUNY. So what has been CUNY's role in the New York Solar Smart so far, mm -hmm. and what will be the responsibilities of the ombudsman? So Chair Barron, I'm going to, um, we're gonna make our first call to the bullpen if, if with your uh, approval. Sure. Um, because we have folks here from our Solar Smart program, and they're doing okay. great work, um, so. I'll just ask if you would uh, have 
we respond to the affirmation from the council. Okay, would you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today before the Higher Education Committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. And this is William Oberker from our Solar Smart program. All right. Um, so, uh, Sustainable Kini has led the NY Solar Smart program since its inception over a decade ago. Um, working with New York City agencies and the utility to be able to streamline uh, permitting processes uh, around getting solar energy uh, into New York City, into our infrastructure. Um, Eleven years ago when the program started, there was one megawatt of solar capacity in New York City, and no one really knew where that was. Um, with the advent of Sustainable Bikini's NY Solar Smart program and the time since then, we're now nearing 200 megawatts of solar capacity uh, over the last 10 years, and we've developed uh, pretty sophisticated processes for, for tracking uh, pretty sophisticated metrics. Um, one of the uh, essential key roles of the Ombudsman team, which was initially funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, was to work with uh, city agencies and the utility to uh, ensure the utmost safety for the citizens of New York City while uh, allowing this relatively new technology or this burgeoning technology uh, to really uh, incorporate itself into the infrastructure of the city. Um, so there have been large successes through the NY Solar Smart program in the solar energy arena. Uh, an emergent technology now uh, is battery technology, energy storage systems. Uh, and essentially, energy storage systems are now where solar was, you know, maybe 10, 11 years ago. Uh, all these same processes are, are being figured out and streamlined. Uh, sustainable Community is working with the fire department, with the Department of Buildings on a regular basis, uh, with Con Edison as well, uh, to be able to see the path forward uh, for these energy systems um, to really be safely incorporated into the city's infrastructure in support uh, of the city's goal of 100 megawatt hours of uh, solar energy storage and a gigawatt of solar and the state's goals of 1.5 gigawatts of uh, energy storage. Thank you. What are the opportunity, what opportunity will CUNY's involvement with New York Solar Smart offer students in terms of interns, internships or work study jobs or hands-on experiential learning? Uh, directly, we do have an internship program within Sustainable CUNY and the City University of New York, and obviously we, we pull exclusively from CUNY students for, uh, for our interns. Uh, for instance, right now, our, our primary web developer uh, started out with us as an intern from Queens College, and he was able to, to stay on in a part-time capacity uh, after graduating with a master's degree. And then, uh, more broadly, right now the solar industry, uh, not including including energy storage, uh, employs 2,300 uh, New Yorkers within New York City alone. Um, and in order for those job jobs to be able to uh, be available in the first place and be sustained, uh, the processes by which uh, these technologies are permitted and incorporated into our city uh, need to be streamlined to make sure that those opportunities continue uh, to grow in availability as, as uh, opposed to constraint. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, before I call on Councilmember Cumbo, I just want to go back to the uh, units of appropriation. Mm -hmm. So, would CUNY be supportive of going to, or uh, having the council go to OMB and talk about uh, a separate unit of appropriation for each of the community colleges? Would you be supportive of that appeal? Um, I, I think it's something that we're willing to talk about. I, I, you know, I don't want to say yet Chair Barron would be supportive of because I think we have to see how that would affect the community college operations. I know that there's, um, you know, certain restrictions on moving monies between units of appropriation, and we don't want to limit our colleges in terms of they have to move money, let's say, from PS to OTPS. But certainly willing to have the discussion. Um, you know, in a, in a prior life, when I was at the Department of Ed, we increased the units of appropriation there by 50% from one year to another. So we're absolutely open to that discussion okay. in partnership with the Council Finance Division and, and OMB. 
Great, thank you. We'll now have questions from Council Member Cumbo, and I do have to step off, so I'm going to ask Council Member Rodriguez uh, if he would chair until such time as I return, which should only be a couple of minutes, but okay. Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank you for your presence here today. I wanted to begin with child care on college campuses. Yeah. Uh, Chair Barron held a very eye-opening uh, hearing on that last year, and I wanted to follow up with it because I strongly believe that every CUNY campus should have the ability for uh, families to be able to have child care in order to complete their education and to do so at the highest level. Yes. Uh, do you know what the total budget for child care programs across CUNY campuses are right now? And what percentage of CUNY campuses um, are child care ready? No, and, and thank you, Councilmember Cumbo, for bringing up that, um, that issue because we agree with you. It's one of those critical functions that we can have on our campuses. And I believe currently we have 17 child care centers at the university. Um, some of our campuses obviously are um, smaller graduate programs like the Graduate School of Journalism, the Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, which, you know, child care center wouldn't necessarily be uh, appropriate or effective, but, um, but most of our campuses do have child care centers, so we have 17 of them. The total budget is um, $6.75 million, um, the sources of which about 3.1 from the state, um, 500,000 from the city, um, about 2.2 from the federal, from federal funding, and um, a little less than a million dollars that's redirected within CUNY's budget. Um, so it's about $6.7 million. One of the things we're really concerned about, which I, I mentioned in my testimony very briefly, is um, the proposed state budget would reduce the funding to the child consents by about $900,000. So it's something that we're working with the legislature and our uh, folks in the assembly and senate to get that restored. It was restored this past year, and we're, we're optimistic that it'll get restored for this year. So. Um, very critical function for our student parents, uh, very critical operation to have that. And you know, one of the things I always like to say when we talk about child care centers is um, one of the great services that they provide, not only to our student parents, but to the children of the students, mm -hmm. um, is our child care centers are not, you know, babysitting. Um, there's instruction right. that goes on at our child care centers. Um, so it's, it's a great uh, learning experience for the, for the children of our students as well to be in, be in an environment like that. Do you know the calculation of that in terms of the campuses that are child care ready versus those that are not? Do you know the percentage? Um, I don't know if we have that, but I mean, 17 of our campuses have. Um, Out of how many total campuses? We have 24. Um, but again, some of our uh, graduate programs wouldn't have a need for a, a child care center necessarily because they are smaller. They only have a few hundred students. Um, the students, the, most of the programming for some of our graduate schools are at, in the evening. Um, but we'll look at our um, schools that have undergraduate programs that don't have a child care center um, and get back to you about which ones would be ready to um, operate one or not. Because we would like to see all of the CUNY campuses child care ready. And um, as a new mom myself, and I'm 43 years old, some might say, well, some of the older, more established members don't need child care, but believe me, I need it. So I'm sure that uh, some of the more advanced degree programs and uh, programs that you brought up, I'm sure families and parents could benefit uh, from that as well. Uh, I wanted to, there was a, a specific issue of a child care programming space at City College, mm -hmm. and we spent a great deal of time at length on that. What is the status of those renovations, and where have parents at City College been sending their children in the meantime? Oh, I can tell you that the renovations will be completed by the summer, and the child care center can open for the fall term. So the renovations will be complete. So this in 2018, yeah. that space will be ready and open uh, to the CUNY uh, campuses at that time. Yes. The other issue that was brought up at the hearing was also uh, the fact of the timing as far as when the child care services are made available to students in terms of some, stu some parents have early morning classes, some have late evening classes, and it didn't seem that the... Um, the child care centers were available necessarily at the times that parents needed them based off of their school schedule and work. 
Councilmember Cumbo, uh, with your and, and the chair's approval, I'd like to call up uh, Keisha Fuentes, who's our Director of Child Care Services at the Central Office, to, chair Barron. to address that. Would you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today before the Higher Education Committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? If you would state your name. Keisha Vaughn. Thank you. Hello. Can you, Thank you please ask me the question one more time, Claire? It was in regards to a hearing that we held in regards to child care on CUNY campuses. And through that particular hearing, um, Individuals that did testify, and even after the hearing, spoke about how difficult sometimes childcare is in alignment with their school and work schedule, and that parents may have early morning days, they may have late evening times, and the hours and the time frequency in which the centers are made available do not always correspond to um, the childcare centers. So it would be an ideal situation and wanting to understand through the 17 or so campuses that already have, do they have like maybe 8 a.m. to 8 to 9 p.m. hours? So that way it's, it's, it's non-traditional in terms of how people would see childcare, but yes. most people that are working as well as going to school have non-traditional hours. Yes, um, based on the different campuses and different structures and the different needs of the um, student parents, um, some of the funding kind of prevent the child care centers to provide services um, throughout the day for the student parents. We have some centers that do provide um, services from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and then sometimes on the weekends and on um, Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, and um, they're able to accommodate their student parent needs. Some of the um, centers need more funding to get more staff in order to accommodate the student parents' needs. I think in the moment that we're in and just moving forward, Sometimes we know that there's a greater need, but we never vocalize exactly what that need is. And so if you could uh, begin to understand on different tiers, you know, in terms of the existing campuses, this is what it would cost to operate this many centers if we had full day, what we just described as full day. Mm -hmm. um, if we had uh, child care throughout the entire CUNY system, what would that cost? Uh, capital as well as expense, so that we could begin to understand and actually ask for it um, versus saying stuck in that space of, we know we need it, but we just don't have the resources yes. to, this is what it would cost for us to be where we need to be because this council is very concerned about child care. Yes, I will take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have just a few more questions that I wanted to go through. Um, uh, when we first came into office, Chair Barron was very instrumental um, in leading our uh, committee as far as the uh, merit-based scholarships. Mm -hmm. And if trends from the 2017-2018 academic year continue, how many students do you anticipate being eligible for merit-based scholarships next year? And in order to accommodate the number of eligible students this year, the council had to reduce the size of each semester's per student award from $400 to $350. For the council to both restore merit-based scholarships to the previous size and accommodate all eligible students, how much money will CUNY need? We're very appreciative of the, this entire committee of higher education for um, allocating that funding several years ago for the City Council Merit-Based Scholarships. Um, very successful program and makes a, a, a huge difference to the 23,000 students that are receiving it this year. Um, so in terms of your question, question Council Member Cumbo, um, we, this year we had a first-time freshman enrollment increase of about 3% and we're anticipating that again next year. So. The 23,000, if it grows by 3%, there would be about another 700 students that would be, a, um, that would be eligible, so a little less than 24,000. And we agree, we, we would like to have the award go back to $400 per semester. Um, as you said, we had to reduce it to 350 to, to fit into the allocation. So $400 per semester for 23,700 students would be about $19 million, and that's what we're seeking in fiscal year 19's budget. 
Repeat that number once more. $19 million. $19 million to get us to where? To get us to $400 per semester for 23,700 students. Understood. Glad we've got our work cut out for us. Thank you. Um, wanted to ask as well about dormitories. So how, how does CUNY make the decision about which campuses will have dormitories and which ones don't? And I'm very interested in Medgar Evers College having dormitories more specifically. Mm -hmm. So, so wait, let me go back and just tell you what CUNY has. CUNY has um, four dorms that were actually constructed on our campuses. And, the, and then for, there's about 4,000 students in dorms, which is a very, very small percentage of our total population. Half of them are in dorms on, on college campuses. The other half are in dorms that we lease. So the, the, you have to have space if you want to build a dorm. You have to have space, and we do a study to basically see what the need is. So that's how we build them. Um, if, as far as leasing them, it's kind of the same thing. We do a study to basically see what the, what the need is. Um, we are now looking at a new model where, we're, where we're, we'd be able to have dorms all, basically all over the city. But the first thing is you have to show that there's a need because the city and the state are basically guaranteeing what the cost is. And, and the other thing about a dorm is, for New York City is, it has to be self-sufficient. You can't use tax levy money, you can't use state money um, to run the dorms. So it has to be self-sufficient. And that's just for New York City. So. And what do you, how do you determine if there's a need? Because from what I've understood from other hearings is that for let's say our foster care uh, community, when many children are aging out of foster care, for those CUNY campuses that do have dormitories, I've seen where those uh, students are able to then transition into CUNY housing to complete their education. And for many of our students that potentially might be living in shelter, um, dormitories are also another option for them um, in order to be able to have housing while they get their education. And I know that the population at Medgar um, certainly does have both. Um, as well as many other students that are commuting um, that could benefit from a dormitory-style campus? Well, the, the, the issue with the foster care, we started that program. The program mm -hmm. is small, um, and it's really open to any foster, care, any foster care student that basically wants to enter that, enter that system. Um, last year, so far, we have 100 students. We're adding another 20 students to that. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, what we do is we, we the 100 spaces, um, we reserve for foster care. Um, but the, the- What is the need though? Let's say you reserve 100, but there's a waiting list or a demand of how many that would benefit from that? Well, well the number of students that um, would benefit comes from ACS. We work very, very carefully with, with ACS. Um, and so every year we're going to increase the population. Um, I guess your issue at the beginning is in order for us to increase the population, we're going to have to have more and more dorms. Um, so we're looking at a model where we will be able to, where we'll, we're going to try and get dorms um, in other locations in the city, just like what you're saying. I think Medgar Evers would be a perfect opportunity for you to expand that program. And I know that this committee would be very interested in working further on that with you. And I just have one other question. Um, so for the recruitment, you say that 36% of your faculty um, now come from CUNY? Or is it that in terms of diversity numbers? No, no, 36%, um, are, that's the diversity numbers. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does CUNY on your campus, do you have some kind of like a marketing program that from the time you come in the front door, it's CUNY wants you. And if you want to become a faculty or a professor or a teacher or part of the administration, CUNY wants you. And if you're interested after you get your degree in coming here to teach, 
We're gonna get you on a track from freshman year so that after senior year, maybe even after your graduate degree and other programs, that you have an opportunity to teach here. We want you, that's our goal. We wanna recruit you and CUNY wants you. It's, it's, it's slam bam in your face as soon as you get there. Because I was an adjunct professor um, at Pratt for 10 years, but it's not like anybody necessarily recruited me in a way. It was more someone outside saw me, and I never even thought I could be a professor because I was 24 years old, and to be an adjunct professor on the graduate level was quite intimidating at the time, but someone saw that I could do that. So I think it's important to be able to let students know that you can be a professor and you can be a professor here because I, I have, to be honest with you, if someone that had not tapped me and said, I think you can do this, I would have never dreamed because I have this lofty goal of what professors look like and maybe necessarily didn't look like me. Well, um, our doctoral students at our graduate center, um, part of their um, program is they do provide teaching to our campuses, and so that's, that's a, a really important um, part of their doctoral program and, and helps our colleges in terms of having additional teaching power. But um, with the chair's approval, I'd like to ask if our uh, university dean for diversity, Arlene, Dr. Arlene Torres, who's here, can come and talk a little bit about on what we're doing in terms of uh, recruitment and um, diversity, our diversity program in general. Good afternoon. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today before the Higher Education Committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. So let me talk a little bit about the... Um, Would you just give us your name, please, Arlene for Flores, University Dean for Recruitment and Diversity. Thank you. So CUNY does have a vision for trying to enhance um, the diversity and the inclusion of faculty across the system. And one of the challenges that we face nationally and also locally is how do we create a really critical pipeline um, eventually, right? And But we need to start now. And so the kinds of things that CUNY has been involved in has been a CUNY pipeline program at the Graduate Center where we have students come from the CUNY campuses and they spend the year and in some cases the summer and they participate in um, what is leadership development and research opportunities so that they begin to think about careers in the professoriate. So that's one pipeline program. Other kinds of pipeline programs that exist on some of the campuses, you may be familiar with the McNair program and that program is geared um, towards students, again, um, participating in programs over the course of the academic year and in other cases over the course of the summer to advance research opportunities and they work with a faculty member who serves as their mentor so that that student begins to think about opportunities that may be available to them to pursue a career in the professoriate. We also are one of, um, one of the historic um, system-wide uh, campuses that is supported by the Mellon Foundation. And um, four of our senior colleges have received funding for over the course of 20 years from the Mellon Foundation to support pipeline programs to enhance diversity in the professoriate. And I can proudly say that I have been a mentor to a number of those students um, at Hunter College, including the young lady who is now a Rhodes Scholar. She participated in one of our pipeline programs, and my hope for her, as well as many of the other students who have participated in the program across CUNY, is that they become future members of the professoriate at CUNY and also nationally. I think that sounds great. I would just like to add that I think it's so important to start at the freshman orientation 
because I, I graduated with a degree in art history, and I never, I just thought I was going to be a, a museum director or curator or something like that. It never occurred to me that I could teach. So I think that it's important from freshman year that the student body understands that if this CUNY education is successful, you will be a professor here at this school. And then allowing them the opportunity to have classes and opportunities along the way um, in order to fulfill that goal. Because I, I, I feel that I'm a strong component and when I see some of the decisions that are made in terms of how people are selected to lead throughout the city, I always feel that it should come internally because the greatest compliment to the work that you do is that your own graduates become um, trained and educated uh, enough so that they could then lead the very program that educated them. Yeah. So I, I would definitely think that freshman year is the year to begin and to start that pipeline and discussion there and just hammering it away that we want to, that, that CUNY wants you. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I have just a couple of follow-up questions and the hour is late and we have more people. So what we may do is summarize the questions and put them in written form and send them to you and you could respond to us. So you had said that there are 36% diversity in CUNY. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking at your 2014 through 2016 three-year compilation of CUNY workforce demographics and I don't see any real increase. You have some charts, you've got some graphs that show the uh, demographics. And I think where I saw an increase was in the uh, higher education officer series, the HEO series, and I think in another. So my question is, I haven't seen a, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Yes, I, I am. haven't seen. Oh, I haven't seen it. So, what does 36 represent? 36 percent. What does that represent in terms of blacks? What does it represent in terms of Latino? And what has been the trend? Because in 2015, there was a report from CUNY which said the previous 20 years had only seen a one percent increase in black faculty. So what do blacks represent in that 36% and what has been the trend and are they particular uh, titles in the citywide, in the system wide um, of CUNY that we can see where there are those increases? Okay, if we look at full time faculty uh, and we compare 2015, 2016, and 2017 figures, and I can give you that update because I, um, I noted that you mentioned, I think that you only have the figures up through 2016, and we just produced the 2017 figures. Uh, for our total minority in 2015, fac full-time faculty, there are 2,568, and that represented 34%. In 2016, it was 2,594, and that represented 34.5%. And then in 2017, it was 2,746, and that was 35.9 or 36%. Is that black? Among African Americans, yes. let me um, go to specifics now. In 2015, the numbers were 929, that was 12.3%. In 2016, 918. So in real numbers, there was a drop, and that represented 12.2%. And in 2017, there was an increase in the numbers to 944, but a percentage pretty much stayed the same at 12.3 percent. So CUNY's not doing well. It's been, it's the same pattern of what we've had in the past. So it was the question that I asked the first year I came here. What are we doing to increase the number of blacks? And we'll add Latinos as well and Asian. But what are we doing? I'm not happy. 
Here we are five years later, and it's the same. So let me talk a little bit about what, uh, what kinds of strategies we are employing now to address these issues. We are producing very detailed quarterly reports that we provide to the Board of Trustees where we analyze what the changes are from year to year in the number of faculty by race and ethnic group and by gender. We use the affirmative action plans that are developed on the campuses where they track the number of faculty that are hired and those that leave the institution. And we deal with um, understanding the underutilization. And what we mean by that is what is the market availability of let's say Latino faculty in the field of anthropology. And then we look at what the numbers are at CUNY. And if those numbers fall short of the market availability for anthropologists among Latino, Hispanic, or African-American anthropologists, then that unit is said to be underutilized. What we are doing now is that we are asking the department at the department level on each campus when they are conducting a search they must assess whether or not they are underutilized. And if they are underutilized in a particular field, then they have to submit a plan of action when they conduct a search as to what plan of action they will take to address that underutilization, how they're going to engage in recruitment practices, how they might change their search process, and what are the specific areas in which they are going to engage in recruitment and of even educating the search committee itself to improve outcomes. And so we are now tracking that information. We receive those plans in the fall from all of those departments that are experiencing underutilization for any race and ethnic group and for gender, and we, are at, and we receive that data, and now on March 15th, we are poised to receive a new data set so that we get some understanding of the search process and whether the things that they said they were going to do that were in their plans, they carried out, so that by the time May and June rolls around, if a hire was made, we're in a better position to understand the hiring process and the outcome. That sounds great, okay? But those are just words, and there has not been any demonstrated results over five years. It was in your master plan. It was the master plan the first time that I was here. Now it's called Connected CUNY. But the results are not matching what you say is your intent. What kind of incentives then? Sometimes people need some incentives. What kind of incentives can we give these departments, which I'm beginning to think is just a continuation of the old boy network and you know the, the white man club that exists. So what kind of incentives can we give or what kinds of um, consequences can they be when they don't, oh, we tried, but we just didn't do it, no. You know, the city's got goals for MWBEs, and we have incentives to make sure that those goals are met. What can CUNY do? Because in five years, it hasn't changed. Well, as it stands right now, we are working very hard to understand the metrics. And over the past year, some But when we have all of these occur. plans and metrics and we don't get the results, what difference does it make? So, it's fine that it's on paper. So some improvement did occur. Over this past year, we had, we have a small number of hires. So we had 311 hires over the past year. And out of those hires, 
over 40% of those hires were of people of color. So we have, we are making that kind of concerted effort. And I agree with you, it's not enough. But coupled with this expectation of reporting and of understanding the search process, it will also allow us to develop some leverage when it comes to performance management tools to, un to speak to the presidents and to the provosts and even all the way at the level of the department um, about what the challenges they're experiencing and what the outcomes are and how they might improve those outcomes. I thank you for your testimony and I would love to have those reports that we can look at them and perhaps we can't sit down, we can sit down and see what some of our committee members can uh, do to, to get results rather than just have it on paper that this is what we want to do and we're not seeing that. And I would also like to know, I'd also like to know um, in what areas those hires were were uh, made. Okay. I would be pleased to provide okay. with those reports. Council Member Cumbo has a question. I really want to echo the sentiments of Chair Barron because we have been a part of this committee now for five years and for us, we understand the metrics and we understand that the numbers have not moved. It would be in terms of something that you are doing, I don't feel that everything has been exhausted. So for example, we're the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus of the City Council. So at the very least, I would even start there. We have positions open in these particular fields of interest. Can you all make recommendations? Or can we come to your districts and to do recruitment there? Can we advertise in uh, culturally specific advertisements in newspapers and, and those sorts of things in order to get the word out? I've actually been although the numbers haven't moved significantly, but with the FDNY, you hear you know, the advertisements everywhere in terms of the fact that there is this particular campaign. So for us, we're just hearing the numbers every year, but I think that it would be more empowering if you would engage everyone and to cast your net far and wide to say, this is something that's really important to us. We're asking for help and support and assistance we want to work with the BLAC on the city level, on the state level, the Black Congressional Caucus, all of these different bodies. There are so many different you know, sororities and fraternities. There are so many different uh, programs that you could really tap into. And I, I feel that that talent pool exists, but it just simply has not been. Uh, are you also recruiting even from some of our HBCUs as far as uh, student population. Of course, we want everyone to come from CUNY, but there are also opportunities for that type of recruitment from our historically black colleges and universities, which might mean that travel budgets are allocated or uh, professional uh, departments where they do uh, uh, hiring and that sort of thing, and, and students can come to find out what jobs are available to them upon graduation. That should, it, it, I just can't believe that I just can't believe that the talent doesn't exist, but what I can believe is that the recruitment efforts have not been sufficient. So we, we would appreciate the opportunity uh, to partner with you. Um, the recruitment process at CUNY is quite extensive. Uh, we do work with direct employers um, in order to provide um, information statewide and also nationally to the jobs that are available. And we also do have resources within the central office to support uh, faculty and chairs of search committees to go to conferences and also to um, develop partnerships and relationships with uh, predominantly um, Hispanic serving institutions as well as HBCUs and in some of the recruitment plans that have been submitted by the departments to the central office, they are taking advantage of those opportunities and working with the HSIs and HBCUs to enhance their recruitment effort. And I just want to add also, I know Chair Barron, you, you've had 
held hearings on this on this topic over the years, and we know that that you and the rest of this committee is going to hold us accountable on this issue. Um, I just want to add from the university administration's perspective and just give you the assurance that our board is holding us accountable on this issue too. And our board is, um, uh, we've had several board committee meetings where um, they've been asking for more data on this, asking to see progress as you, as you pointed out. So again, I just want to give you that assurance that um, our board, this is a very, very important um, issue for our board and they're holding us accountable and we're going to continue to work on it. I'd like to add something. Um, as somebody who's, who's uh, served on the appointments committee of my department for 30 years, um, there was always a frustration, and it, it, it spanned over several administrations. Many times I felt, and this is, this is my perception, that the administration was more interested in going outside um, of, the, of the college. Um, to recruit and not within. And we had very, very competent black adjunct faculty mm -hmm. that were put forward and were not selected. Um, the adjunct, there's a tremendous resource in adjuncts. And, and in our department, we had over 100, 150 adjuncts and maybe 30, not even 30 full-time faculty. You had a tremendous resource. We knew the faculty, the adjunct faculty. We knew their track record and yet, I think the, the administration needs to look at that as a possible resource and, and to level the playing field here. To, and, and it was very frustrating being on the appointments committee, putting uh, competent candidates forward, and, as, as, and we knew over maybe a 10-year period that they were great in the classroom, they were phenomenal expertise, and yet they weren't selected. And they'd rather go outside to Montana and, and recruit somebody and Many times that didn't work out because they couldn't make it in New York City, they couldn't um, afford uh, the rent, and as we would lose them. Sometimes we'd lose the candidates. So I think look within sometimes to, in the adjunct, tremendous adjunct faculty in, in many departments throughout the university. So I would suggest that as, as uh, yeah, it's, in, it's, in addressing Chair uh, Barron's uh, remarks. No, uh, thank you, Councilmember Holder. It's a very fair point. The university has done um, over the years, we've done a few rounds of adjunct to lecturer conversions. Um, in the last agreement with the Professional Staff Congress, there was um, also part of that agreement was to convert um, adjuncts to lecturers as well. And so um, we're very open to having that discussion. So it's, it's a good point, and I, I'm grateful for you to raising it. Uh, we want to thank you for coming, for your testimony. We've got many, 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 many more questions, but we'll submit them in writing. You've thank been you. here for several hours, and we do want to thank you for your uh, testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, we'll move to the next panel, and we appreciate your patience, but I think, as you can see, it's very important for us to get these questions out so that we can look to see how we can make improvements because this is unacceptable. CUNY is doing great work in other areas and I appreciate that. And you know I'm a proud alum from Hunter and uh, we wanna make sure that we continue to do great work. So at this time I'm gonna call the next panel. That'll be Barbara Bowen from PSC, Sharon Persinger from PSC, Meg Findlay, might not be Finley, from P Peely, Feely, F-E-E-L-E-Y, Feely, -E -E Feely, from PSC. And we're also going to ask Levi Castle from Nyperg to join this panel because this is the last panel. And we are so appreciative that you stayed for hours and hours to be able to bring your testimony. And we'll ask you if we could start. Yes, you may begin. Just give us your name and you may give us your testimony. Uh, we're also very appreciative of your being here and staying. I'm Barbara Bowen. I'm president of the Professional Staff Congress CUNY.
Um, and I'm Sharon Persinger. I'm the treasurer of the professional staff of CUNY, and I'm on the faculty at Bronx Community College. My name is Meg Feely, and I'm an adjunct lecturer in the Department of English at Kingsborough Community College, and I'm the adjunct liaison for uh, the union at Kingsborough. Uh, my name is Levi Castle. I'm a sophomore at Queens College and also a board representative for the New York Public Interest Research Group. Barbara, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you Ms. very Bowen. much. Oh, did we do our um, swearing in? You don't have to. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, all right. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. Very grateful, um, as always, uh, Council Member Barron, for your seriousness and conscientiousness about this committee. Very um, pleased to meet one of our former professors at CUNY from City Tech. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, before I start my formal remarks, I just want to say one thing about the discussion you had in the last panel. Um, what, what wasn't mentioned was that CUNY is not hiring full-time faculty at the rate at which they should. And yes, it's great that 44% of the most recent group of hires are people of color, but there should have been 2,000 people hired last year, not 300. If we had 44% of that group, then you would see a big demographic change in the faculty overall. And why isn't CUNY hiring? Because CUNY is underfunded. And the other piece of that that goes to funding is that a major issue with every single faculty member of color we've tried to recruit, and my department has been extremely successful, is the heavy teaching load and the relatively low salaries. So when we talk about money, I'm not saying that that, that, there, that is the only issue because there are also other issues that have a, a terrible and long history, but we've got to look at the dearth of hiring and the um, high teaching loads and low salaries. People, it's very difficult sometimes uh, because other places can offer much more to, uh, to prospective faculty. So um, I do want to say in, in starting that we are pleased that the city has maintained a pretty, um, a, a pretty uh, continuing budget for CUNY. They've continued their commitment and that the mayor has continued a commitment to adding to CUNY's budget, that's important. As you know, after years when there was subtraction, to have adding is important. The mayor has uh, increased funding for STEM programs. He has committed to expanding ASAP with 18.6 million committed last year. Those are very good things to talk about. They are specific programs, and what we're gonna talk to you about are things that reach all, overall throughout CUNY. Um, You've heard earlier from the CUNY management folks, the administration, about CUNY's really unmatched record in the entire country in helping students to move from the lowest quintile of income to the highest or to the middle class. CUNY is unmatched in the country. Among the community colleges that were ranked by a, a national study coming out of Harvard and Stanford, of the effect of college on income compared to the parents' IRS returns of the two-year public colleges, the top 10, five of them are CUNY community colleges. We have only seven, and one is very small, Gutman. So the, the rankings of CUNY are extraordinary. But, and, and we see that with that, there are literally tens of thousands of people whose lives are changed. And in a city that continues to uh, talk in this administration, and certainly your leadership here has been so focused on opportunity, um, CUNY provides an unrivaled opportunity. What's missing, however, is the funding to allow all the students of CUNY to have that opportunity. And we have seen the consistent underfunding, especially at the state level, but also at the city. And that means that here's this engine um, that could do and does do fabulous things for students. And yet there are tens and tens of thousands of students who are not graduating, who are not reaching their own goals. You know, our graduation rates are 6% after two years from the community colleges, 18% after three years. Uh, the, the national average is not great either, it's 22%. The largest factor in that is poverty, the students coming out of poverty, that is the biggest stressor of all. But a second factor is the lack of resources when they get to CUNY. We should be doing everything to make up for that so our graduation rate can be 95%. Imagine the difference CUNY would be making in this city. And we have, what's, what's uh, difficult for us is that to, 
to wrap our heads around is that in a city where people are constantly talking about needing to find solutions to the problems of the city, let's find solutions, let's study. CUNY already has that solution worked out. It's already demonstrated that CUNY can transform lives one at a time and families at a time because you know better than I do that it's not just the individual, it's the whole family and the whole community that's there with you in the classroom. So we have something that all is already proven to work and yet there's not the investment to make sure it does work. So we really want to call on the council, and you have been a total champion on this, to work with us in a time when the city does have some money to increase the funding for CUNY. Um, CUNY itself, uh, CUNY colleges, need 87.7 million more in total funding. Um, that includes almost 50 million, whoops, in mandatory costs, uh, which includes costs for inflation, and also collective bargaining. Um, we heard Matt Sapienza earlier talk about our collective bargaining agreement. You know about it, um, Council Member Holden. And uh, it was approved by the city, but it's not fully funded. We've got to have, that's a basic cost of doing business. It should be in the budget. Um, there's also, we do support CUNY in their request that the amount that the city puts in for the associate degree programs that are located in the four-year schools, that that be increased by the um, level of inflation. It hasn't changed for 20 years, and we believe that that should be increased uh, just to keep up with inflation. We also uh, call for closing the TAP gap, and we can talk about that further if you'd like. I just want to talk about a couple of other things, because I know you've been here a long time, and my colleagues want to speak. Um, CUNY is also calling for $34 million to invest in student success. There are proven things that help students to succeed. It's not a mystery. It's really not a mystery. It's just a question of whether it's done or not. This past fall, or winter actually, we reached a very important agreement with CUNY management to restructure the teaching load for the full-time faculty so that there would be more time to spend with individual students and less time just churning from class to class. Our, but that, and that changes the number of courses. And you listened to us when we, you did a wonderful hearing and our members testified. You heard us on that, I remember. And the city said to us, the mayor's office, get an agreement on paper and then we'll talk about funding it. We got the agreement much sooner than we thought. And in order to implement it properly, it needs to be funded. And what we are calling for is every course that is not going to be taught by a current full-time faculty member. Those courses should be amalgamated, put together, and they should be a reason to hire new full-time faculty, not just to increase the exploitation of adjuncts, because the whole point was to create more time with the individual faculty. And we see funding this new initiative as an opportunity to increase diversity of faculty. It's not huge numbers, but it could be big CUNY overall, could be a thousand CUNY wide, um, to increase diversity and move adjuncts into full-time positions. And then the last thing I'll mention before my colleagues speak is about adjunct faculty, and, and Meg is an adjunct. Um, we heard, uh, heard you speak about it, and Councilmember Holden, you mentioned that. Um, what has happened over the last uh, couple, well, since let's say since 2000, CUNY's total student population has grown by 45%. That's the equivalent of adding Baruch and Hunter. But the funding for CUNY, especially for the state side, did not increase, did not keep up with the increase in student population or inflation. So what did CUNY do? More and more students coming in, less and less money per student. What they did is cut their costs of instruction, the basic cost, by filling the classrooms with underpaid adjuncts. So now we have about 7,500 full-time faculty and nearly 15,000 underpaid adjuncts. That is a crazy way to run a university. Uh, to pay adjuncts as low as they do means that adjuncts have to run from one job to the next to the next because they, they can't be there. They have to talk to an adjunct this morning who's working five jobs. How much time can she give to her students? And she's a brilliant teacher. How much time can she give? So one of the chief things we are looking for is the council's support and help as we seek in collective bargaining to increase adjunct pay so it's at a fair level and so that it's a dignified wage 
There is something very wrong about an institution that's famous for moving its students into the middle class, and meanwhile it's moving its faculty into lower, into poverty. Meg just said into poverty. There is something weird there. And I think the council can play an important role in calling attention to that and helping us to fix it. So we ask you to work. This is an opportunity year uh, because there's some city funding that's there. The city is not in a deficit mode um, to take this opportunity this year to m make sure that the city, that it's a priority for the new speaker. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, a priority for the new speaker to make those basic investments in mandatory costs and in things we know allow students to succeed so CUNY can reach the potential that it has and, and be, the, uh, be the force and the resource for this city that it should be. So uh, we know we have counted on you in the past and you have come through for us. So we thank you for that and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Um, thank you again for giving us the opportunity to speak here, uh, Count Chairperson Barron and Councilmember Holden. I appreciate that you're that you're listening to us carefully, and thanks to the people in the audience for not leaving. Um, I've spent the last uh, week and a half, you know, talking to the um, legis to legislators in the state about this. So. Um, and I've been rattling off numbers um, to folks because that's kind of the way I operate. But I sort of really want to, to talk about some of the things that CUNY students need. Uh, I know that the CUNY management made a request for an additional $34 million, and it was labeled as to invest in student success and on-time graduation. So that led me to start thinking about what CUNY students I, what I think CUNY students need to succeed. I mean, I've taught at the community college, so I really know community college students better. Um, just some statistics about CUNY students. 60% of them have family incomes less than $30,000. 45% of them are the first generation in their, in their family to go to college. 77% of them are people of color. 57% receive TAP. 36% are immigrants. If you ask anybody who teaches CUNY students, they'll say, well, some of my students are part-time, some of my students are full-time. Uh, maybe they, some of them even take 18 hours, 18 credits of classes in a semester. But almost all of them work in addition to going to, to school. Some of them work full-time in addition to going to school full-time. Um, they care for children. They care for their siblings sometimes. They sometimes have parents who are ill or, or grandparents that they're responsible for. Um, some of them have immigrated to New York City alone without anybody else in their family coming. Some of them are homeless. So I think what, is, what do they need to succeed? Well, I'm a teaching faculty, and so I would say, uh, I'd like to say yes, we. They should, they should be taught entirely by full-time faculty. But I think actually the, the thing that with that population, it seems to me the thing that would make the most impact is that they really need student support services in a thorough way that the university is just not currently providing. Um, they need full-time advisors and counselors. We know that that how effective that would be because that's the thing that the ASAP program, which triples the community college graduation rate, that's the thing, one of the things the ASAP program provides. Um, there are counselors assigned to a student and they're supposed to meet with that, uh, students meet with that counselor regularly, monthly, sometimes more frequent. Um, that counselor is they officially call this model intrusive ad advising, uh, which means that that person is there to assist the student in navigating college, uh, to get on their case, you know, if they're not doing well, to uh, see that they take advantage of um, tutoring facilities, writing lab, math lab, if they need that, to see that they're connected to psychological services or social services if that's what they need. I think that 
all community colleges just about need, all community college students need support like that. I know I would have benefited from support like that. Um, here's the issue. In ASAP, the ratio, the number of students per counselor runs around, it's supposed to be around 60 students to 80, maybe to 100 students. Outside of ASAP, the ratio is 600 students to one counselor, maybe even as much as 1,500 students to one counselor. So that means that CUNY needs 10 times as many counselors. Um, you know, that's one of the things that this additional money to invest in student success and on-time graduation could be used for. I know that there are a lot of other things that we could say it could be used for because it's, it's all the, the legacy of the underfunding of the institution. But this kind of money is what's really needed, I think, to get CUNY students to succeed. Turn that on, yeah. Hi, thank you so much, and I'm so honored to be here in a house of the people and speak. Um, I just taught my second day of the semester, and I'm kind of, I wish I could tell you what it's like to be in a classroom with students who are bursting to tell you that they've been thinking about the assignment from day one. It's just, it's an exciting job I have, and I love my job, as do most adjuncts that I know. But the problem with adjunctification is that it's a race to the bottom. And what we're seeing, and to piggyback on what Sharon said, what we're seeing at Kingsborough as the adjunct liaison, I've become aware that we have 200 people working at Kingsborough now who are part-time, they're non-teaching adjuncts. They're using a line that we have to pay for meeting attendance, and they're using it, the administration is using it, to pay advisors, people who are advising veterans and disabled people and people uh, of all kinds, freshmen, you know, transfer students and what have you. Um, and they're working on the non-teaching adjunct line, and they're, they have a maximum of 225 hours per semester. They work two or three days a week. Uh, last fall, they were laid off because there wasn't enough work. Um, this is adjunctification. And what we're seeing now is a replication of what happened with my predecessors and with me as far as teaching adjuncts are concerned. So because of our activism and because of our union, we've gained benefits, but many of those benefits are not in the contract for non-teaching adjuncts. And it just becomes a race to the bottom. Same thing with continuing ed teachers. If you tell a family of four that they can have $200 a month to eat on, they'll do it okay for a, a month. But after that, two months, how long will they be able to live like that? That's what is happening in CUNY. That is what is happening at Kingsboro. It's happening every day. I haven't really gotten an effective raise in years. Um, and I know that the price of, of things is going up. Um, I don't want to talk about how I make it or anything like that, but I do want to say that I know that for some people this is a question of ethics, and I asked Bill Thompson, I serve on the um, University Faculty Senate as an adjunct re representative for my college, and I asked Bill Thompson, the chair of the Board of Trustees, if it kept him up at night that he was basically balancing the budget of CUNY on the backs of 15,000 adjuncts. And he said, yes, it bothered him. It was ethically problematic. He said, but I don't know how to solve the problem, he said. And I want to say that I am very grateful that I think our union has some answers, really. I mean, we get together. We are the university. We are talking shop all the time. And we do have some answers. And, and you know, it's from uh, Albany, I have a button here, it says hashtag bring the money, okay? It's really that pedestrian and that boring, but our students deserve Harvard. Our students deserve the best money can buy, and if that's possible in this great city, that's what we have to give them. And I want to bring that to them. I don't want to make a fortune. I'd be happy if I could make $45,000 a year. That would make me very happy. Um, that's what we're really asking for to do the same work. I don't want to teach more than two classes a semester. I like being able to give my students the time I can, but I can't really live on that either. So 
That's what we're asking for, but our union always asks first for CUNY and second for ourselves, and that's what we do. And, and that's what we're here for today, is asking for our students. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, and on behalf of Nyberg and myself, I'd like to say thank you for um, allowing us to give you our testimony. In an increasingly economically divided and high-cost city, degree completion is vital. The key of, to improving degree completion is improving access to programs that have a steady track record of success and in increasing graduation rates amongst the, among the students most at risk of dropping out. Students who are enrolled in ASAP graduate, or I'm sorry, students enrolled in ASAP graduate at more than double the rate of non-ASAP students. ASAP, SEEK, and College Discovery offer many benefits that are necessary to the students and to our city, and they should not only be protected, but expanded. Waninta um, from the community, or sorry, from Queens Community College ASAP wants to share a bit of her story. I love the program. We have much better tutors than the rest of the school, which is so important for my math studies. So increasing support to opportunity programs will help the city meet job growth needs across all income levels. NYPIRC urges the city council to protect and increase funding. We have noticed that too many students are unaware of the programs like ASAP until it is too late to enroll. Tyrell, a former student at Bronx Community College who had dropped out, shared, I found out about ASAP too late, but if I had known about it, I would have applied to it for the tutoring to bring my grades up. And then he also pointed out, textbooks were the biggest cost. I couldn't keep up with my studies because I couldn't afford the materials, and this is when I was receiving TAP and Pell. Pell helped for some, but I also had to pay for all of my living expenses. It's way too much. NYPIRC urges the City Council to work with CUNY and NYC Chancellor and the Board of Regents to ensure more eligible students have knowledge of, knowledge of and access to opportunity programs like ASAP and to create a citywide strategy for raising awareness of true college costs while supporting opportunity programs which address such expenses. Alexis at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, student and mother, shared, between textbooks, metro cards, and paying for diapers and food for my son, I often can't afford to buy food for myself. I would like to make a special note on this issue. It's called food insecurity among CUNY college students, and myself am a victim of this growing trend among college students. I honestly, I'll raise my right hand, is I haven't ate since Monday morning. And that's not because I've been too busy or because I didn't have time to have a meal. It's because due to high cost to, from Metro cards to textbooks to the high cost of rent here in the city to my bills, I just simply have to ration out how often I can eat because I simply cannot afford because the money that would go to food has to go to my Metro card in order to get to the classes that I need to take in hopes for a better income in the future where to, I won't have to feel food insecurity or anyone else. So we urge the city council to provide resources that reduce and eliminate college student food and housing insecurity, as well as expansion of single stop offices at all CUNY campuses. Without support from the city or state, CUNY community colleges will be raising tuition $100 this year. This will be unfair burden placed on New Yorkers who often don't receive aid due to their immigration status or inability to commit to full-time course loads. Currently, one-third of CUNY's community college students attend part-time. We urge the city council to ensure that students and families are protected from the burden of a tuition incre increase at community, community, sorry, CUNY community colleges and senior colleges. NYPIRC urges the city council to expand city programs that support undocumented students, particularly programs that undocumented students benefit from such as ASAP and Citizenship Now. In conclusion, programs and initiatives that have proven to work must be expanded. Any investment in higher education will have a net positivity impact on the city. We appreciate your continued support and thank you. And I'd also like to note that the adjunct issue is not only an issue for these workers, but also the students. Me personally, this semester, my adjunct professor for my astronomy class, every second class of the week, he has to leave from 10 to 20 minutes early just because he has to make another job at another university. And that is not the professor's fault. That is CUNY Central's issue, and that is also the issue of the state for underfunding CUNY for so long. So thank you for your time. 
Uh, I want to thank the panel for your testimony. It's a very uh, practical, very direct, very hands-on, and I appreciate it. I do have a couple of questions. Eli? Levi, what school do you attend? I go to Queens College. I'm a sophomore there. You go to Queens College. What kind of assistance does Queens College have for students uh, such as yourself in terms of um, food, a food, food pantry? Or um, so actually in the past uh, year, um, starting last spring, NYPIRG, the organization that I'm a board represent for, along with several other um, clubs on campuses have actually organized a food pantry. So right now we are collecting food and it is available to students, but is not nearly enough for the high demand because- So it's something that students initiated? Isn't that yes, something- Yes, oh. it's something that students initiated. Although I am aware that on other campuses it's a different situation, like administration has also initiated. But for a lot of campuses, students are the ones who bring this up and organize to help other students. Okay, um, thank you. And um, I'll talk to you afterwards. We'll talk to you and to, to the question of non-teaching adjuncts, what would be the title or what would be the position that you would have if you weren't an adjunct? What would be the series of titles that you would fulfill? So my observation is that most non-teaching adjuncts are working under the direct supervision of people in the HEO line or the um. higher education officer line. So that they, and I have heard that there's been a freeze on hiring in um, HEOs at Kingsboro, uh, but there has been instead this rise of non-teaching adjuncts to fill those positions. If I could just add, um, CUNY has a considerable number of people who are adjunct, meaning, you know, in a sense, part-time, and some yes. of them are really full-time, part-time, but, um, and as Meg said, uh, in the non-teaching category, since most are teaching, the others non-teaching, some work in libraries, some might be fully qualified as a librarian, um, but be a fill-in for somebody who's on parental leave or some other kind of leave. Um, there are quite a few in libraries. Uh, those are the steadier and better paid ones, um, but they're, what uh, Meg was talking about, I think that's very important, is um, using non-teaching adjuncts as advisors. I mean, Sharon talked mm, about the crisis right. and the number of advisors. The solution is not to replicate the whole system of underpaid part-timers to do the job. The solution is to get the funding in so that people who are fully trained and fully, and a lot of the part-timers are fully trained for the job, they just can't get the full-time job. Mm -hmm. So um, I, the concern that we have is that we're seeing the trend of replacing teaching faculty with part-time teaching faculty at a third or less mm -hmm. of the pay now being replicated with other mm -hmm. kinds of staff, same problem with the pay. Councilmember Holden, do you have yeah. any questions? Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Barbara Bowen for your leadership in uh, PSC CUNY. It's been amazing what you've done in, in, the, in the years that you've been president of the union. Uh, you've advanced CUNY, you've advanced the union, you've advanced the faculty, certainly. Um, a tremendous job. I want to thank you for all you've done. And, but there's a lot more work to be done, and, and you've said it today. Um, there's a, I have a lot of, you know, be, I have a lot of, um, comments, because uh, the questions, the community hasn't invested um, in the faculty. Uh, like I mentioned before, the full-time faculty continues to drop, actually, in, in my department over the years. We would see people retire. We would see, actually, faculty recruited from the department to work in the administration and given release time, which was a big problem within the, in the departments. So they would take the, the dean would take some faculty, give them full release time, and they would still have a slot on the faculty, but they weren't in the classrooms. And I just couldn't understand that. Why not just recruit from uh, outside, get your, um, your HEOs, or get, get other um, deans and, and so forth, assistants to work, um, get them from the outside. Let, leave, let the faculty mentor the, the students. 
So my department had one time 18, like I mentioned before, 18 full-time and w way over 100, I forget the number of adjuncts. That didn't make any sense. You have m many adjuncts stressed out. They're running from uh, school to school. They, they were going at teaching at Queensborough, they were going out to Long Island teaching at, at Nassau, and they were working, uh, let's say, in Manhattan at another uh, CUNY campus. It was an impossible schedule. They're exhausted. They, and they're terrific faculty, we just couldn't hire them. There were not enough lines that particular year. They would never invest in the full-time faculty. I just don't get it. They, we invest so much in capital, uh, so much in the expense budgets. The, the biggest investment has to be made in the faculty, in the full-time faculty. And, you know, there was a time they had a target faculty, full-time faculty student ratio. I don't know what it is now. But it was never where it should be. Now, just to give you an example, we had students, and I had um, DACA students, and, and undocumented students who came to me, and I, a few of them I would uh, talk to, and I said, um, you know, you're a very good designer. I, I taught communication design. You're a very good designer. How come you can't, how come you're not really doing your work like you should? She goes, well, when I go home, I can only sleep because there's another family coming in. Um, so I, once we sleep, we have to get out, and we don't, I don't have a place where I can work. So I, I gave my office to some students who, I said, you can stay in, and I might get in trouble for this, but I said, you can stay in until the security guard finds you at three in the morning, whatever it is, but just uh, be quiet and work on the computers and you can do it. And I, many of the faculty, we would also buy students books because they couldn't afford it. And you know, you feel, wait a minute, this is a very good designer, very good student. I can go and, and buy it on Amazon or eBay for a fraction of the cost. Let me just, and I sent the books right to their homes. And it works. But you need full-time faculty to mentor the students because they have the deck stacked against them. Like I said before, they have a very difficult situation, uh, not only in the college, but in life. And we owe it to the students to give them, I mean, it's just a, it's not really a large investment for full-time faculty versus adjunct, I think, in the long run. And I don't know why the university continues with this adjunct trend, which many of the private colleges are doing, which is wrong. And, but they're getting huge, um, obviously, um, uh, they, they have a, a, a lot of money coming in. Their um, tuitions are way out, out of like, the private institutions. So we owe it to CUNY to really fight for, and I want to thank you for fighting for the full-time faculty, and um, we don't have enough. We never did, by the way. Um, but I, I want to thank you again for all the work you're doing. Well, thank you. I, it's really a privilege to be able to do it. I feel that every single day. I do feel that, and I agree with you, and it's very, very good to have your voice on the council. I mean, I think that will be um, a, a very good thing. Uh, in terms of the ratio, I think you're absolutely right, putting your finger on the ratio. It's last time I looked at it, it was about one to 35 at CUNY. It was one to eight at my college when I went to college, one to eight. It tells the whole story, right? How much time, they have four times more time to spend with each student and a smaller teaching load. And I mean, the, what you just described is extraordinary to send books to students' homes and um, you know, you're right, they do have the deck stacked against them. As Meg said, we should then be giving them Harvard, not, meet, not meeting them with more poverty conditions when they get to college. They've already succeeded when they get to college. And then to throw at them hardship conditions and not support them, to me, is a real act of oppression against the students. And um, there are things we can do, I agree with you, and it's very important to raise them and to, to try to make sure that the council can continue to be a voice to say we just have to do that basic investment and then students will do better. I mean, we've heard it from everybody, especially Levi here today. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm really glad you're speaking up about it. I want to thank the panel for coming and for sharing the testimony. Uh, we appreciate it. And yes, the problem is that there's been a lack of funding from the state and also from the city, but mainly from the state to be sure that we can provide the education and provide all of the amenities that go with that. And CUNY's revenues now depend, I think it's 54% 
on tuition, and that's why they keep raising tuition each year, they call it. They started out calling it rational, and they had to, we got so much pushback, they had to jump and change it to predictable. But it's an obligation of a society to educate its population. And CUNY uh, is subjected to that lack of funding from the state. So we've got to mobilize the forces. There are partners that we have, certainly in Albany, but we know that the governor talks at education, but does not put the funding in to support what it is that he says he understands to be important. And yes, he did do the Excelsior Scholarship, which is, in fact, in my opinion, uh, a factor that contributes to the gap that exists between blacks and whites in terms of students being on campus because we didn't have the question posed to CUNY, but we do want uh, to find out how many students in CUNY were able to get any type of support from the Excelsior Scholarship, which we know is last dollar in. And we know that the money in the main that's coming in through the Excelsior Scholarship is supporting those families at $100,000. And we know that in the main, those are not black or Latino families. So the people who are benefiting from the Excelsior Scholarship are in fact generally not black, not Latino. So that influx of the population that's coming is in fact increasing that gap that exists. But we do wanna thank you so much and we're gonna to continue to battle and struggle and work collectively and collaboratively to improve what it is that we know CUNY is capable of doing. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, and with that, seeing no further testimony, we are adjourned. Thank you so much.